Hello, audience. Good afternoon. This is Mike Watt, teacher here in Petaluma. Uh, welcome Lumicon, fans of Lumicon. Uh, if you're a fan of Lumicon, you might also know me as Towel Man. And it is my honor today to be here with Robert E. Barnes, master of everything clay and beyond. Good afternoon, Robert. Uh, howdy. How are you doing today? Good, good. good so, Robert has done a lot of work, immense work in uh, uh, multimedia and lots of different films and video games and so forth. But let's get to know Robert a little bit better. Robert, what can you tell us about yourself, family, and where you've lived, where you grew up? Uh, I grew up in Southern California, Went uh, was a, a beach kid, uh, moved to, uh, went all the way through college down there. I did one semester at Sonoma State, so I, and my, my grandparents were East Bay, <laughs> so got got East Bay roots also. Um, moved up uh, for my first job, actually my first internship in college. Um, and after I graduated, my first job was was uh, at at uh, Industrial Light Magic in the the uh, down in San Rafael. Yeah. So I've been up here ever since. We moved to Petaluma a year after moving to the Bay Area, and. Uh, 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 another few years later, my uh, first daughter was born. She's 23 now. <laughs> so you you had her in class, yeah. I think, in fourth grade, uh -huh. Mr. Norstad. Uh, uh, and then uh, Justine, my younger daughter, who is um, who graduated um, from Valley Oaks uh, two years ago, three years ago, three years ago. Excellent. So, yeah. Yeah, and the amazing Izzy is just over there. Help us out. Hi, Izzy. Is well for, for those, and. For those. Uh, and she is part of the inspiration, I think, of some of your creatures in the sense of her love for lizards. Yeah, uh, that's right. That's right. Uh, so uh, I've, I've been interested in, in animals my whole life. I've been interested in drawing my whole life and, and art. Um, and it definitely uh, are. <laughs> we've ended up having a developing a reptile collection that started with me capturing little blue belly lizards. Um, at Skywalker Ranch, actually, for for reference, for some of the the uh, dragon giant lizard creatures there, um, and I that was my first reptile keeping um, uh, experience was up there just long enough to to get some observations, and then then I set them free. But uh, I also grew up with my mom had reptiles growing up, so I've been a uh, exotic exotic pet and uh, animal enthusiast since I was a kid, <laughs> and and so like. What uh, interested you in working in this? A lot of your early work is uh, done in clay. A lot of the stuff you did for many, many years and some amazing clay things we're going to share with you today. Yeah. But uh, as a, a kid, what, did you like do a lot of Play-Doh lizards or anything I did, like that? I, I did. Well, yeah, like 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 a lot of kids, there's a lot of, you know, going all the way back to kindergarten, there's, you know, basic ceramics and, and um, uh, what I remembered is that the girls could always make really neat snakes and snowmen and mine were always very lumpy and, <laughs> and awful so uh, I've, I've been trying to catch up ever since <laughs> but then, i think yeah. you've done and surpassed some of those girls probably I, I might, maybe maybe you know, no they, they i haven't tracked them so see what they're doing but um yeah I, i've just always loved drawing uh, legos were my by far my favorite uh, toy growing up building building my own it was mostly spaceships i think uh, uh, and just whatever out of Lego. Um, but I've always, uh, between that and drawing was probably a, a good part of my, you know, just time and keeping myself busy as a kid. Great. Um, and my brother, I've got an older brother who, who always drew better than me and everything. So I was, uh -huh. I was always trying to catch up to him too. So was, there was a lot of, of, uh, uh, you know, being inspired by people around me that I, that, uh, whose work I admired, whether it was, in, in kindergarten or, <laughs> or my brother, like my whole life. Well, let's talk a little bit about your education. You, you mentioned kindergarten and you, know, you went to Long Beach. Did you like major in uh, like arts or did, would you also take anatomy or anything like that that helped you yeah. uh, with your process? So I, I started, um, uh, I started after high school. I didn't take any art classes all the way through high school. Um, I actually started off as a physics major in college at the wow. local uh, at Harper, Los Angeles Harper College down uh, in, in Los Angeles County. Um, started as a physics, ma physics major, did that for a couple of years, and um, then 
uh, was interested in art and started taking some basic art classes, probably just to fulfill general ed. Uh -huh. And there's kind of no turning back once I started. Uh, uh, so yeah, that put me on the art track, which is all drawing, painting, um, 2D and 3D design. It's, there's, there's a basic curriculum that, that all um, graphic design uh, and uh, fine arts students uh, go through that that is pretty common to, to junior colleges and the, the state Cal State and and UC systems all kind of have the same so yeah that was a really uh, a great foundation in in all of the uh, all of the artistic mediums from from drawing basic drawing all the way through life drawing with live models um, uh, 2d and 3d design which is uh, which sort of the, the building blocks for graphic design and um, and industrial design um, and then the sort of then there's the upper level um, uh, uh, sculpture and, and and painting oil painting the the, the, the whole the whole gamut of, of fine arts training right. I did eventually switch from from after switching from physics to fine arts switch to industrial design which is actually designing uh, uh, products for mass production. So okay. that's where uh, traditionally a lot of the uh, before schools had entertainment design, a lot of designers for, um, uh, you know, for spaceships and things like that hardware were trained in industrial design. So that kind of drew me in that direction. And I just uh, appreciated the, the emphasis on function that industrial design um, that study lent. So um, yeah, sounds yeah, great. It's, yeah, it was, it was a, <laughs> there was a lot of years <laughs> bounced around a lot. So, and it sounds like there's a certain amount of formal education, like you know, criteria of art education that you have. To, but it sounds like also outside influences can also round you out as an artist, like uh, be able to take not only what you learn formally about line and texture and stuff like that, but also what you observe in the, the natural world or what you learn about structure yeah yeah so i mean almost any time in, in in most design and art classes uh uh as soon as you're you, you've gotten into the classes where you can pick your own subjects to, to to work on that's when you can that's where your own interests start to to come in uh and that definitely happened with with industrial design um uh where your own style and and uh inspirations uh, start to come into play right now there are there are programs a lot of art schools have entertainment design specifically so when I was going to college uh, and where I went there wasn't uh, there wasn't a class I could take in designing a creature or drawing a creature or sculpting a creature um, but but I'd been doing that sort of thing since I was a kid uh -huh. and uh, so all the the skills I learned in more of the fine arts world transferred into the more uh, fantastic uh, type of stuff I did for entertainment once I once I went into that, right. so that the skills all translated. It's just that instead of sculpting a, a from a live model or drawing from a live model, I was drawing more from my imagination and and uh, uh, or or artists that I was collaborating with uh, for to come up with designs. Right, and I, I like because I, you brought up inspiration. I was curious about like what were some of your early inspirations because I remember as a kid, like in the fifties and sixties, there were certain clay monster movies. Like uh, was oh, I want to say Ray, yeah, Harry Ray, Harry, Ray, Harry uh, yeah. did the classic uh, stop motion, right? Yeah, so those, and before time kind of things. Yeah, and, well, any anything with creatures in it, dinosaurs, you know, yeah. it's kind of the classic uh, inspirations as a kid uh, artist. All I drew, most of what I drew as a kid were, were robots and, and dragons and creatures and things. That's definitely where, you know, and that that was all inspired by movies. And when the, uh, really when the, the Star Wars films came out, that was a, a huge, uh, and all the creatures specifically uh, yeah. from that were, were a big inspiration. Um, and seeing uh, when uh, when the specials would come out on TV, and this is something you know, it's not like now where you can see it whenever you want, uh -huh. but they would do the, the making of Star Wars and and 
these shows would show how the the people that made the creatures and and how they did the camera work and everything um how uh how that was all done and i was fascinated by that to see that the people behind the scenes who are creating the designs or or, or operating the puppets for creatures right. um and uh, so that was always kind of cooking away in the back of my mind. Um, and it wasn't actually until I got into college and realized that people that were getting the same training that I was getting in industrial design had worked on the first Star Wars films at building models and creatures and things that uh, I realized that I could, I could actually go in that direction as a, as, uh, you know, pursue it as a career. So that was a big moment. Yeah, I remember uh, I used to work in uh, San Rafael and being around in the industrial park area there where yeah. ILM was and we drive by and they'd have these you know huge models of these odd creatures and we yeah. really couldn't fathom what was going on until we, we understand yeah. like the, the bigger picture. So is that kind of where you got started with ILM and what was George, what's his name again? Uh, uh, George. Uh, <laughs> Lucas, Lucas, maybe? Lucas, yeah, yeah, that's it. George Lucas. Um, Tell us about that. So that was... Um, uh, after I'd finished up my, my junior year of design school, that's traditionally when you try to get an internship. And I, uh, uh, was my fiance at the time convinced me to apply to Lucasfilm and I figured I had no chance, but, but put together a, a pretty, you know, a, a good, good application. There was a lot of writing su uh -huh. surprisingly. Really? You had to have a certain GPA to even apply. Wow. So, um, and, uh, I, I made it through, I think, three rounds of interviews and, and landed an internship at Industrial Light Magic in the art department there. Um, and that was that was really the, the turning point for me was was it was just so mind blowing to, to be there and see see the people who were doing the work and and and, uh, uh, you know, work in this behind the way uh, behind the scenes way as an intern. Um, and just just the amazing artists, you know, unlike anyone I'd, I'd known personally before then. Um, so that was the that was definitely the the turning point for me, and and what got me got me started in the business was was that internship, and and working really hard at it and making a good impression so that uh, so that I was asked back after I graduated. So that was it was really that that internship program there at. at uh, uh, Industrial Light Magic and Lucasfilm that, that got me started because um, then after I, I finished my last year of design school and they offered me a job when I when I graduated yeah. so that, you, that, that's when I moved moved up yeah. permanently. <laughs> Do you recall like the the first thing you sculpted for ILM or for for Lucas? Uh, I th the first thing I sculpted uh, was um, uh, during my internship, I worked on on the Casper movie, and um, then now ILM already had sculptors, so I wasn't I wasn't there to sculpt. I was there to help the art department. Okay. Um, uh, so I I might have helped mount some sculptures and things, but I didn't I didn't officially sculpt anything. <laughs> but once I it was uh, when I was hired to work on the Star Wars um, the Phantom Menace art department. Um, the concept art department uh, at Skywalker Ranch was when I started sculpting, and I actually started with painting sculptures that were done by Richard Miller, who was a, a longtime ILM sculptor and mm -hmm. taught me a lot, and uh, and Tony McVeigh, who was working in the art department at the ranch. Um, it was actually mostly Richard sculptures and some sculptures from the art department in England, uh, and there were some. Uh, there were a couple times that sculptures would arrive and and were damaged, or uh, there was there was a creature, one of the pod racers, who George decided he wanted a head. It had been sculpted with the head of one design, and George just decided he wanted the head from a different, an older design, mm -hmm. on that body. And so my first actual sculpting project, official one, was sculpting this uh, the new head on a on a different body. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> technology is okay. I can read that. Um, you know, live, live TV is this live TV? Sure, uh, <laughs> live ish. Um, so that, yeah, that was a, it, so the sculpting work kind of came in. It started as uh, most of the sculptures were, were done by 
uh, for episode one by other sculptors. And uh, I painted a bunch of them. So I got that, uh, you know, in addition to art, you know, I've been sculpting since I was a kid, but um, getting to work directly with, with other people's work mm -hmm. um, and then modifying them as needed. Uh, by the time I finished episode one, uh, I'd done enough of that that, that Doug Chang, the, my art director, um, was confident having me start episode two as a full-time sculptor. Wonderful. So, which was, yeah, amazing. Uh, I got to do all sorts of other stuff on episode one that was was fantastic. And uh, in addition to the starting with sculpture and painting, but um, yeah, that by as of the start of episode two, I was I was a dedicated sculptor. Excellent. And so, and I think that's an interesting aspect of it that you, uh, even after you graduated from college and all that stuff, you still had a lot of learning to do. You don't just jump in right away and become a master sculptor. Yeah. You work your way up again, yes. up to the scale of uh, learning from the, the 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 people that have the, the skill sets there. Yeah, that's right. So there were there were um, like I mentioned, Richard Miller, um, uh, Tony McVeigh was as, who's still sculpting. I think he did the um, did, did he's done the maquettes for um, for the Mandalorian still. Yeah, nice. So he's he's still still at it, but he was his work was definitely the benchmark that I uh that i went after and, and he was he was very generous uh with his with his uh advice and and uh um both he and richard um and uh terrell whitlatch who was a, a an amazing creature designer as well uh, taught me a lot about about the importance of animal physiology and um and her her design method i i I ended up sculpting some of her creatures, uh, and and then uh, Ian McKegg was also a, a, an amazing creature designer. So working with all of them, learning along the way their their guiding principles and and getting their feedback as I sculpted their work um, uh, was invaluable. It was definitely that was like the graduate school <laughs> for me was was working with all of them, and and to have that group of people as as my instructors was was amazing. Great. And I'm glad you brought up the physiology and the process because, you know, can we uh, see some of your work here and you can talk about some of the sure. physiology because you can't just make like, a, you know, I, I mean, when you're younger, you can make a lump of clay into a mouse and yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. or, or it's stick figure kind of thing. But I think you have uh, stuff here to share that is uh, yeah. uh, very um, impressive. So, yeah. Um, what would you like to start with? And uh, then you can tell us some of the backstory, what the what particular production it came from, anything yeah. like that. Um, uh actually if you can maybe hand me that I need to so so this guy um is uh this is actually sort of a, a takeoff on Grendel uh for a, a movie called um Outlander um which is kind of a mashup of of Beowulf and um, something like Predator or or Alien, um, so this is my take on a on what would be the monster Grendel, or actually the Grendel mother and the babies down below. Um, so this is something that uses a lot of uh, human physiology uh, anatomy, which is something I uh, through art school from doing life drawing. Um, so, and when you say the physiology, you mean like the the so muscular the, formations? Like yeah, you can kinda, see the legs really have quite a bit of detail to yeah, them. Yeah, sorry. Um, the uh, yeah, so it's it's how the muscles and bones are put together underneath the skin. The the uh, the sort of guiding principle is that we're all, you know, we've all been around and um, been observing animals and. Uh, and people <laughs> our whole lives and we have a sense of what what looks right um, and what looks functional right. um, so there are things like like having the, the spines those are actually tentacles on the back that are they're that like a, like maybe a sea anemone or something uh, with that could be venomous um, and then all the kind of human anatomy a grendel was supposed to be a kind of a, a, a humanoid monster um, yeah, because I like the idea that you, it's very sinewy. You can see the uh, muscle structure, yeah. but also there's a, a bit of uh, uh, kind of disbelief in the idea that, that you know, is that structurally uh, 
uh, you know, physically possible to have that that kind of muscular build, but that's what makes it even more like kind of creepy or scary. Yeah. Or unbelievable. I, like, you know, you wouldn't want to meet that in a dark elf. No, no. <laughs> and then it, uh, the, uh, the head is, uh, it's kind of viper uh, inspired, viper crocodilian inspired. Uh, the jaw is, huh. is very similar to like a crocodilian kind of, uh, let's see if I can get it close enough. Uh, have your assistant there. Yeah. Right there. Whoa, um, look, oh, there we go. Yeah, maybe too close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, there you go. Yeah. So we've got to meet that. <laughs> uh, it's all right. So um, uh, what else can you tell us? You know, do you want to get into like some of the, the structure of those particular things? Like uh, uh, whether that's all clay or do you want to explain that a little bit more with a, an, another? Uh, yeah, actually, well, I can something? show. So, well, yeah, so the, the mechanics of the creature kind of gets into how the sculptures themselves are built. Um, the thing with, with sculpture is that if you're working with soft clay, you can only do so much before it starts to fall, before it starts to fall apart oh, or fall, this is great. fall down. So this is a, um, I hope the camera picks this up okay. But um, so this is a, believe it or not, a uh, this is sort of a galloping crocodile um i could see that i could see uh, that crocodile in there so this this is the humble beginnings of of what a sculpture is it's all it's a literal metal skeleton that um underneath all that aluminum foil is um uh, aluminum wire or it can be steel wire and whatever works um i'm gonna put that down so this is this is armature wire here uh those are just two two different gauges of, of aluminum wire. And you kind of twist together a skeleton um, out of that wire. Uh, and that becomes a, that becomes the foundation mechanically for that you can build the clay on top of so it doesn't start sagging and falling apart as you go. So that's why you're saying you don't do 100% clay because a clay cannot sustain that, that shape and, and keep that form? Yeah. So. Um, uh, yeah, and and you also don't want so the clay I use I should I should back up a little bit is a uh, is um, uh, what I prefer is, is a clay called Super Sculpey, which is a it's a polymer clay that that you can bake and um, uh, and that will harden uh, in a just a home oven, and I've been using it since I was since I was a teenager uh, to do my own sculptures and then found out once I got uh to ilm but that's what that that's yeah. what the actual sculptors use too um yeah and so. we you talk about many people have probably used sculpey in different forms like i i used to do sculpey like ornaments with my kids and stuff like right, that right. and so. we've used them in the classroom and stuff like that so yeah, yeah it's a so it's not a, a a super yeah i mean it's slightly higher end than the, the regular sculpey yeah so there's there's sculpey there's super sculpey there's um a fimo is another one that uh, uh right. there's, there's a few different um uh uh whoa what do we got here um so this i i thought i'd show this because it shows a little bit more of the structure underneath so um so here so this is this is a sculpture for uh armand baltazar's um timeless series of books uh there's a a, a villain um that will but but this is this shows the kind of the intermediate or beginnings stage of a sculpture where you can act, you can actually see the the metal, um, how the metal is uh, armature is is built up there and wrapped so, around. So there's like some thicker wire underneath there, and then some yeah. of the the uh, thinner wire wrapping around to give it a little bit more. Like is that better for the clay to adhere onto there? Yeah, so it gives it gives the the clay something to grab onto um, because that's the other even. <laughs> If you if you just build a, an armature out of just the wire and stick clay around it, uh -huh. the the if it, that one piece of wire often isn't enough for the clay to grab onto, and then it'll start it'll start uh, kind of loosening and and uh, rotating around the the wire, and it can be it can be frustrating. So this is this is just an example of how a sculpture in process um, looks. So I've I've kind of roughed out the. The muscles and and the the masses of the 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 forms. Um, now, does this clay like dry up on you within a few days, or is it, it more it, like it, you're saying about the baking it process that it needs that to really harden? 
it stays. Uh, th this will stay pliable for for a long time if you let it, if you leave, if you don't bake it and leave it on the shelf for years, it starts to crack and dry okay. out. Okay. Um, you don't uh, have to like spray it, keep it moist, or anything like that. To... Um, no, no. This so it's a it's a oil based or a solvent based clay. So it's it, or uh, uh, like the plastiline clays where it's it's uh, rather than being water based, it's it's a solvent based um, and yeah, so it'll stay pliable uh, in, until you bake it. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so as long as you keep working with it, it'll it'll stay workable. And this is, you said, Armando Baltazar. So yeah. this stuff, do you yeah. have, uh, have you done anything, uh, other sculptures for him yeah, particularly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. Uh, <laughs> so these are, uh, uh, so this is, This is wow. Captain Balsamic is is one of the so this is a uh, Armand has has done um, it's uh, probably a lot of the kids are, are familiar with it but it's um, yeah you can timeless I'll put this up here for the camera there's, there's Armand's book so this this is an amazing Armand's a, a writer he was uh, he's a, an art, artist so he it's basically a full novel of um, uh, of a, like a, a a group of teenagers on an adventure, and he's he's created a whole world and of uh, uh, like a fantasy future and past combined. Um, and he asked me to uh, when he was beginning the project, asked me to sculpt some of his characters so that he would have um, some reference and also just something for him to show people that were interested in it before he finished the book. Um, something that he could put out on a table to help show what the what the characters were were like. So this is one of the one of the the characters, um, Captain Balsamic, who's who's kind of the leader. He's the um, the the kids in the story end up on his ship and have to learn to to deal with him as their <laughs> um, as their their captain. Uh -huh. um, Actually, if, if you can hand me the, the, those two, oh. yeah, that one, and there's another bearded one. Oh, yeah. Um, there's just a... So uh, before you go, like, uh, uh, Armando, he is uh, a local guy yeah, yeah. also, so, isn't he? Yeah, so Armand lives in Petaluma, <laughs> has for for many years. Uh, and... Uh, uh, this one, by the way, over here. Uh, sure. Um, so I, I just wanted to show these. So these are... Our character studies for the same, the same guy to show like how the same character can have, he can be happy and laughing like this, or he can be angry and yelling like like that. So um, these are all earlier on, before long before the all the illustrations for the the book were done, um, and just to help kind of kind of develop the character. Um, and then I'm gonna show Ajax here. So this is now who is this? So th this is Ajax, who um, he's he's kind of a steampunk uh, uh, cyborg, actually. So he's got a mechanical arm um, that's steam powered. You can see he's got a steam generator on his, his back there, um, and he also he's he's kind of the mechanic and uh, and Captain Balsamic's right hand man in the in the story. Um, even that's, though he doesn't really have a right hand, that's right. <laughs> he has a giant right, <laughs> giant mechanical Whatever right hand. That thing is. <laughs> um, so this is a this is a cool example of how how uh, putting together traditional sculpture. So this is mostly traditional clay sculpture, and then the arm was actually modeled, um, designed by Armand, and uh, computer modeled by uh, a friend of mine, Dan Witten, um, and then three D printed. Uh, so I was so those really crisp mechanical details we were able to get with uh, wow. through three D printing, um, and then I was able to integrate those into the to the clay sculpture and have this sort of hybrid approach, um, which I want to do more of. Because yeah, but you have some amazing details in there. Like I, I've noticed on the handle of the shovel, you can see the wood grain mm -hmm. there on the feet. There you can see the veins. Talk about some of that process. Okay. How do you get to that uh, <laughs> level of detail? Um, All my clay sculptures still have my thumbprints in it. <laughs> sure, yeah. 
yeah, getting getting away from from that's actually what uh, uh, getting away from 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 fingerprints is a, always a, a uh, one of the first questions that people want to. And we do sculpting. we do have questions from um, Miss Turco's fourth grade class at McNear School and from oh. Mr. Watts sixth grade class here. And a couple of the students did ask about that, uh, like. Uh, what's your tools like? What kind of tools do you use? Uh, uh, tools of the trade that can help you with that kind of detail. Let's see. Uh, I think if you can, if you switch back to this camera, I can show oh, some yeah. of those. Uh, I can actually show in this. You can see the, the uh, maybe. Get, so you can see how lumpy that is. Oh yeah, those, in the those, back. Yeah. Those are my fingerprints and my my fingers doing that stuff. But you know, get it when you get around to the face, it's much more detailed and refined. Um, so it all starts literally just just forming it, um, uh -huh. and then gradually working with tools to 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 refine the surface. And and um, this this tool here, I have I probably have five hundred tools that I've <laughs> built up over time. But I use this probably ninety percent of the time, um, and it's just got it's got a sharp end and a kind of a spoon end, and I will use that to to. Do literally ninety percent of the roughing out of a of a shape. This is a this is a metal one. There there are um, you can get wooden sculpting tools. This is this is another one that's got a just got a finer pointy end and another kind of spoon end. But um, so yeah, one student asked uh, Ava asked about how do you come up with the details about that. So how do you decide what tool is uh, the right tool for that particular like for the hair or for yeah. The beard or for the the scales and the lizard yeah so there there are um details are, are mostly hand tooled in so it's basically the smaller the detail the smaller the tool that's why um you know if if that's if that this is the one pointy tool i have this is a smaller pointy tool oh yeah okay so i literally just just go smaller and smaller there's an even smaller one uh so it, it really is just getting down, uh, starting with big shapes and 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 working down into the details. Um, uh, you don't really want to start with details in art in general. You, you want you want the big shapes to work before you before you, before you concentrate down, on details. So almost like like uh, almost like like a microscope. I'm looking at something from afar, and as you get closer and closer. You yeah. get to see you know, more of what's really going on in the situation. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's uh, in in art and design. You want you want the the piece to work from a distance, you know, mm -hmm. a first impression, and then uh, anything you know details and 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 added to that are gravy on top of, of good composition and good design. Um, but. So that that's that's the same process with, with sculpting. It's starting with the big shapes and then adding in uh, sub shapes and details. So things like the, the veins on the feet and the hands are are great. Once you it's it's like they're kind of there on the the quick read when you, you first look at it. You know your brain kind of registers that there are all these little shapes in there too. And then when you really focus on it, you say, oh, that's you know a really realistic yeah. treatment. Because um, if it wasn't there, I think you know people would just kind of like. Uh, you may not notice it, but it's the, the small details that really register uh, yeah. that making it more realistic and, and yeah. more believable. Yeah, and that's something, especially with creature design, where you're where I'm coming up with something that doesn't exist. You can, if there's a, a, a overall shape of a creature that that doesn't exist, but it's covered in a texture of something that does exist. So you know, something like a dragon has reptile scales that that we're familiar from seeing seeing pictures and and movies of actual reptiles uh -huh. so that that lends a, a believability to it that that is is almost subliminal um uh and that it goes for details and and bigger shapes that's where something like the way the muscles work and the way the the you know indicating how how the skeleton underneath a, a fantastical creature works gives just uh, helps the audience and whoever's looking at it buy into it and, and believe it without, without uh, you know, without uh, taking them out of the the story basically. So right. you you don't want when a when a new creature hits hits the screen, you don't want everybody to be scratching their heads looking at it. They you want them just to believe it as a character and and go on from there. And then you know maybe down the road you can pay attention to how cool it is. But right. um, 
Well, a junior asked, while you're talking about that, junior asked, how do you come up with the stuff that you make? So is this a lot like this stuff commissioned? Do people yeah. give you like an outline what they want? Do they make you know, give you a stick figure? And then you came up <laughs> with this guy? It, it really, it's it's been all over the place. So the uh, working within, generally on a film, it's, you're working in an art department and a concept. For what I do, it's within a, a concept art department which is happening way before anything is shot generally. Mm -hmm. um, and it's working with a director to, um, to flesh out ideas that, that uh, so it may be depending on the director, some of them know very much what they want and some of them uh, just have a, the vaguest of ideas and uh, I'll know it when I see it kind of thing, which uh, is tough for a designer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, the general approach is, is to do a, a few different ideas and uh, uh, based on whatever the, the director says, uh, says is wanted and um, um, and then put it back and put drawings usually in, back in front of the director and, and, ha and the director will choose what direction of those um, to go ahead with. And then it's that, that once there's a direction, it's that, um, uh, process of refining it and making it more specific <clears throat> so are there times like you you have an idea and you design it and i know some of the students asked about that too that you make something and then they go like you put in hours and hours and i don't know how long it takes you to create one of these but you put in a bunch of work and then they go like no that's not it at all <laughs> yeah well so that's yeah so that's why uh that, that's where and this is in, for design in general whether it's whether it's for graphic design or or creatures for a, a movie um uh giving choices so you know the kind of there's a the, the typical thing is to give to come up with three different designs um that cover a range um oh, uh, yeah, Back, you know, yeah that, i think we have some of that over <laughs> here so i had to, i did a kind of a, a a monster rat for for a film and um thank you uh here are, Right. See, we want to just see if we can put them up there. Or? Um, yeah, we can. Um, um, what's his name? Ajax. Ajax, come on over here if you want to, or you can hang out wherever you want. Let's see. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, let's see. I'll switch back over to. So this was uh, three. Just basically wanted a a, a rat with character um, that was scary. And these are just three pretty different approaches. So this is like the brute rat, a big, big chunky guy, um, kind of, kind of blunt nose. Um, this is this guy's more streamlined, more pointy, uh -huh. um, a little bit more close to reality. Now these are all these are all very exaggerated compared to what real rats look like let's um, hope so it says so it's yeah that's where my my role as a designer and and you know what's scary about a rat what do people not like about a rat um those teeth are a big <laughs> big part of that um the way the teeth are spaced out uh um and and how the eyes relate and the having chewed up ears and things so this so this is the pointy version and then this is like the completely insane version <laughs> where uh it's it's kind of kind of in between where he's he's pointy but he's got these giant um, uh, giant eyes that are that are totally out of proportion to reality but make him look more crazy than reality. And like you say, um, that torn up ear is a nice small detail, but people notice that. Yeah. Like, going like, yep. well, it just these must have been in some kind of battle. Now, yeah. were these for a, a movie that that people yeah. might recognize? Or? This uh, these are actually from uh, from Christmas Carol. The, the, uh -huh. The, there was a Disney animated Christmas Carol that I worked on, um, and at one point Scrooge is is uh, shrunken down to tiny size and gets chased by a rat. So uh, that's not, that's where these guys came from. Not, um, not a Care Bear movie. And, I know, it was, <laughs> not quite. It was uh, yeah. Um, so that that's an example where where if there's going to be just one design and you give a range like that, um, the director can choose like does he want to rate it in and have it more realistic or or have one have the design that's more more brutish and and big and nasty or or more more skinny and pointy and and threatening in that way so right. that's that's 
you know, a, a fair example of how, how that can work. So, um, but there is a occasional disappointment, huh? Or, yeah. So mm -hmm. that, that would generally happen more at the, uh, at the drawing. So drawings take less time than sculpture. Um, so, so, uh, usually in the early design process it's drawings and, and, uh, doing that same thing with, with multiple, um, uh, multiple versions of something to, to see which, what direction the, the art director or, or director, um, wants to go with. And so where my role as a, as a, uh, sculptor comes in, I, I would also do drawings, but mostly I was doing sculpture. So that is usually at the point since sculptures take so much more time that, um, the, the design is, is pretty well nailed down. Okay. So once something's being sculpted, it's not as likely that um, that that effort's going to go to waste uh, because, but <laughs> it does also happen that um, uh, that I'll sculpt an entire creature. Director loves it and everything, and then that the that sequence of the movie gets cut. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and yeah. That's, that's, so that could be a big part of the disappointment. You do yeah. all that work, and it ends up on the cutting room floor. Yeah. Yeah, so, and anyone who works in film knows yeah, yeah. <laughs> knows that that happens. Uh, it's just a part of the process. I think anyone anyone who works, uh, you know, it happens to actors. It happens mm -hmm. to, to everyone that 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 you pour your heart and soul into something, and then and then it gets it gets edited out. Right, and your heart and soul and your reason. time. And so, like like something like Ajax or the the rats. How long does it take you to sculpt something? Yeah, that so that's to do a, a finished. Uh, you know, sculpture to, to this level is, is you know, at the very least a, a week for me, some sculptors are, are faster, um, to do a, a full body maquette, uh, at, to a, to a pretty refined level is, is at least a week for, uh, for me. What is a, uh, what is a maquette just uh, oh, for your so technical yeah. term? So a maquette is, is a, a model, uh, a simplified general, generally a model of a, what will be a bigger sculpture. Yeah, in, in fine arts, it's okay. it's a way to plan out uh, what would be a bigger sculpture at a, at a smaller, quicker scale to kind of prove out the design. Um, even though these are kind of pieces in their own right, they're they're um, since they are showing a design that's going to be manifested some other way, like through through computer graphics or or a costumed actor, even uh -huh. um, uh, they're the maquette term still still applies to them because they're it's really the, the last stage in design or or one of the last stages in design so it's it's used as a planning tool uh and in, in uh -huh. getting to a final version of you know whatever the, the character or thing is fantastic um, yeah is there anything else here over here that you'd like to share we got a few <laughs> other creatures oh there's this guy i don't oh. know if people might notice recognize this particular uh, character right so that <laughs> some of the students asked it's like in a like a uh, an Oscar here or something yeah. like that. Do you want to hand the oh, rats yeah. over here sure. and sure. let this guy? Because I know se several students, and and you talked earlier about working with uh, Mr. Lucas. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so let's see this guy. Can I spotlight him for a moment? Sure. Um, yeah. Some of the students asked about Baby Yoda. I can't. I can't claim I did any work on Baby Yoda, um, but. Uh, this was a sculpture I did for for the the folks at Scott. This is the, the artist's proof of a. Um, this is actually an award for the people that have worked at um, Skywalker Ranch for yeah. thirty years, I think. So you sculpted this Yoda in the first place, and then he was cast. Yes, yeah. So he was he was sculpted in in clay, and um, I worked with a with a bronze foundry that's up in Sebastopol. Mm -hmm. um, I did. I made a uh, a mold of the the clay sculpture and and handed that mold off to the foundry and and they make uh, a wax version they pour wax versions into the the mold that i made of the original sculpture um and uh and then pour bronze into the molds they make from from the mold of my piece so it's a it's a multi-step process and what happens to your original piece is it still around or yeah so that it's hard to mold something without damaging it so yeah, i have I, I have a damaged version of the, <laughs> the original sculpture of yoda here but uh and this one is pretty hefty i think it probably weighs as much as baby yoda uh, right yeah, good. yeah 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 <laughs> so um yeah so that's that's uh, the bronze it's a it's a really cool process there's there's a um it's basically how you can make make something 
uh, multiple copies of a sculpture that are going to be around for a right. decent period of time. So um, now, uh, so you did a lot of work in clay. Is clay still the uh, medium that you mainly work with? Uh, I the uh, the process has gone has shifted away from clay for for design for uh, entertainment design. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a similar process, but it's mostly done digitally now. So there's there are uh, uh, sometime in the in the kind of early two thousands uh, uh, digital sculpting programs got to where they were manageable on on consumer. Uh, consumer level computers. And ever since then, the digital sculpting has been creeping in to, to entertainment design. And, and that's um, uh, pretty much taken over now because it's just, it's a lot faster to, to try out different designs. And um, so instead of something uh, taking a week to sculpt um, in the computer, you can do it much faster and change it much faster. Okay. So it's an amazing tool for that. Um, it's for, for uh, an artist who who likes to touch, <laughs> likes the, the tactile part and having something, you know, taking form right in front of them. You don't have that satisfaction with digital sculpting, but that's something that I've had to learn along the way. And, and most of the work I do now is, is digital, a combination of digital sculpting and, and actual computer modeling, which are two slightly different um, uh, processes. But and what um, kind of digital sculpting are you doing now? Can you give us any so, examples of something people might have seen the uh so my my entrance to the to the digital uh uh digital character world was through video games so i'm i'm working at uh 2k games now um on the nba the basketball game All making right. making uh uh synthetic uh <laughs> versions of, of actual basketball players so who are you so, working on now is anybody we would know um name wise I, I, I'm not supposed to say actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> Trade secret right there. All right. <laughs> but I can say I, I I got to work on some some classic. Uh, so so the uh, that technology is advanced enough to where we use actual uh, scan data of of players. So ideally, uh, we actually get three three dimensional scans of the players, all right. including all their uh, you know what amounts to a, a thousands of photographs of them, so that their actual their textures, their skin tone, uh, every uh, gets mapped onto a digital version of them. And um, the team I work on sort of a, takes all the parts and mm -hmm. helps assemble them into uh, these photorealistic versions of the players in the game. Um, so you kind of had to adapt to like changing, uh, changing styles or changing desires in the design process of making these things. But. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's more, so that's, yeah, that we're just, we, we're trying to duplicate reality in, in that, in that case. Um, uh, the, uh, a similar, it used to be uh, when I designed a creature and did a sculpture, the sculpture would be scanned into the computer and that could be used uh, okay. as the basis for a, uh, the model that would be animated eventually. Um, so the difference now is that instead of doing that first sculpture in, uh, in clay, it would be done digitally. Um, and then maybe at some point printed out as a, as something that someone can have on their desk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but. And there's still a lot of, uh, like, uh, things that are made in clay and stuff like that are cast in bronze that people are still buying, you know, artistic items in, yeah. made in that format still. Yeah. So I, there's still, uh, the, there's still a, an appeal to, to something that's handcrafted, um, literally handcrafted, um, that that people like. So there's there's a whole collectibles um, world uh, that I've that I've dabbled in also, um, where um, and and that can be a combination of, of traditional and digital. Uh, okay. But those are so those are you know characters from from films that are that you can buy little sculptures of. Um, from companies like Sideshow Toys and uh, that um, uh, there are artists who, a lot of them were trained traditionally and have uh, now use a, a combination of traditional and, and digital uh, sculpting to, uh -huh. to create. So it's, yeah, there's there's a, a combination out there. Uh, I think there's always gonna be an appeal for things that are, are made by hand. Yeah, I would certainly <laughs> hope so that, especially with our Lumicon family, that we definitely want to have kids still you know, like getting your hands into it and uh, and having fun with it. Um, 
any advice for any future sculptors or our kids out here that like to make things out of other things? Uh, sure. Um, I think, uh, you know, on that, that same theme of, of things going digital, uh, there's uh, the computer is just another tool for, for design. Um, it's not, it's not the, the end in itself. So the, there is, um, uh, as much as, as digital modeling and digital sculpting is, is the practical way that things are, are being done more and more, the skills that are developed in the design sense that are developed from, from working with actual clay and doing, doing actual drawings and paintings um, uh, is invaluable in, in informing that, uh, that transition to digital work. Um, I think there are more and more people that are going straight to, to a digital medium and learning art uh -huh. digitally. But um, my experience is that people that have, have experience in practical or in traditional medium uh, media, whether it's drawing and painting or sculpting and clay, uh, generally have a have a better grounding in 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 design and uh, in in all senses than um, uh, than folks that haven't been able to to uh, to experience the traditional media. So I, I would I would encourage uh, uh, kids to to just build with whatever you can, whether it's it's clay or or Legos or something. It it, it just uh, Anything that you do with your hands is going to translate to, you know, whether whether you know you, you stick with a uh, uh, traditional physical media or or end up doing computer type work later on down the line, it's it's that that physical uh, tangible experience is going to is going to uh, be a great foundation. Yeah, I think that yeah, I think what a, like a lot of this hands-on work does uh, uh, encourages uh, attention to detail. Yeah. That, that maybe you would not get the same way uh, uh, with a screen. I mean, yeah. there's still a lot of process there, but uh -huh. yeah. I think the the details, like really thinking through the details, and I think your uh, advice about knowing the knowledge yeah. of the physiology and how things actually function, yeah. you know, and then maybe slightly thinking outside the box, yeah, is great advice. So, yeah. that whether that your tools are are your computer or tools are your smaller and smaller, <laughs> smaller like smaller. scraper kind of thing is there pointier and pointier tools yeah um yeah yeah it's it's um yeah like i say it's it's they're all they're all tools the computer's a tool you know these are tools <laughs> um and it's it's really uh it all starts with design and the the fundamentals of of um uh yeah for for creatures it's physiology for vehicles it's Knowing what actual uh, functional vehicles should look like for architecture, it's what what actual buildings and all the stuff that you see in science fiction movies and fantasy movies is all based on on that knowledge. Some some designer along the way knew their art history, knew their uh -huh. architecture history, or their uh, animal physiology, or, um, you know, costume design. It all comes from from uh, a, practical knowledge and uh, applying that in a new creative way. Right. So. And as one last question, I know this is always difficult, whether we're talking about your work here or your family. Uh, many of the students ask, do you have a favorite that you have done? Uh, uh, since um, the clay doesn't have ears, they, they won't yeah, get well, upset compared to your, your uh, youngest of them, your <laughs> oldest. The, uh, I mean, the, the the easy answer is whatever I'm doing at the moment is my favorite because that's what I'm invested in. I you know, the these they're all like children to me. Um, the, the designs that I've I've had the most um, creative input on are are probably my favorites. So, well, uh, yeah. So yeah, this yeah, is the next two. <laughs> so there's a creature from from episode two. He's got a soft spot in my heart. Nice smile. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Big toothy grin. It looks like he's um, got like uh, pomegranate things in his nose. Uh, yeah, he's got, <laughs> got the red eyes. Um, uh, that was just a, a really great, uh, uh, just as a process. That, that was a, a case that for episode two where um, I was explaining how how usually for designs, there's uh, drawings are done first because they're faster and, and you can get more ideas out quicker. Right. Um, and this was a case where 
uh, George had kind of an idea of a, of a feeling for a creature, but it, it wasn't as nailed down. And, and there were a lot of, a lot of drawings happening, but, but none of them were quite hitting. And I, and I, I asked uh, Doug Chang, the art director, like, can I just, you know, do some quick head, head concepts to, to put out uh -huh. and to maybe get it, get it started. And, and, and he said, sure. And, and so for the next, the next meeting, I had three, once again, three different heads, just uh -huh. not the whole body, but just the head designs for, for what I kind of thought that, that George was looking for. And sure enough, he chose one of them. Uh -huh. And I went from there to, to you know, to uh, making a body that, that made sense with that, that head. And, and uh, eventually the, the next suit was born out of that. And that's from, you know, multiple different uh, animal features that, that influenced it and, and uh, uh, down to how, it, how I imagined it moving. And, um, so that, that was, uh, there, there have been a few of those cases where I've, I've been able to design something from the ground up, but, uh, that's the one that, that sticks with me the most. And does it have a name? Uh, the, well, next, the uh, next is the, the type of creature it is. Uh, but it, not yeah. like Carl or baby or cuddles or anything that's like the, that? Yeah, that's, uh, there was <laughs> cuddles. Yes. cuddles. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you hit it, hit it right there. <laughs> well, thank you, Robert. Really appreciate your time. Kids. Like Robert says, don't give up your art, you know, keep on doing what you're doing and love everything that you do. Robert, yeah. really appreciate your time. Yeah. And right. Izzy, thank you for your help over there. Anytime. All right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Lumicon. We'll see you soon. Thank you.